Um, welcome to the second evidence session of the Productivity Commission. The Productivity Commission is hosted by the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. I'm Jagdeep Chadha, the director of the National Institute and the chair of this commission. The commission is in itself part of the Productivity Institute, which is centred at the Alliance uh, Manchester Business School, which the managing director is Bart Van Ark and one of our uh, commissioners. The number of commissioners uh, with us today who will be investigating carefully what we can learn from the international experience on productivity as in terms of what lessons we can learn for the UK uh, and um, the extent to which we can set the scene as a result as well as our previous evidence session which was looking directly at the issues within the UK. And the idea uh, on the back of these two evidence sessions is for us to publish a paper later this year that sets the scene um, for the policy evidence sessions that we'll be carrying out over the next couple of years under the Productivity Commission. Um, this afternoon, we are absolutely blessed to have four wonderful witnesses uh, with us today. Um, and uh, rather than introducing the commissioners, I'll ask them to introduce themselves when they first come in to ask a question. It will, it will take just too much time to go through everyone who's involved today. But I will briefly, if I may, introduce uh, um, the Deputy Chair of the Commission, Adrian Pabst, who is also Deputy Director of the National Institute, and I'm doing that for online type reasons in case there is a problem with the internet connection where I'm at. Adrian will take over the chairing of the proceedings because. Um, and as I said, the witnesses we have this afternoon are, are quite exceptional um, experts in this field. And we very much hope to learn uh, from their experience and their research in the next couple of hours. First, uh, John Fennell, Professor of Economics at INSEAD and uh, also longtime uh, associate visitor at the Federal Bank um, of San Francisco. John, welcome. Uh, Chiara Crisciolo, Head of Productivity and Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the OECD, long-standing uh, uh, researcher whose work we've learned from over the years. I'm very particularly delighted she's able to join us today, um, uh, this afternoon. So thank you very much for coming along, uh, Chiara. Chad uh, Searson, Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, written a number of notable uh, survey papers that we've learned a lot from. I'm looking forward to uh, bringing those insights into our Productivity Commission. And finally, but in no way, least in any way whatsoever, Beata uh, Javorczyk, Chief Economist of the EBRD, who um, has, has worked consistently into very high standard on questions of trade uh, and investment internationally, but certainly also will be able to guide us as to some of the policy interventions that the EBRD is involved in as well. That is our uh, witnesses, and we're going to start, if I may, by uh, inviting each witness in turn, in that order, John, Chiara, Chad, and Beata, uh, perhaps a, a brief introduction, but, but more importantly, perhaps a short statement of some of the critical issues from their research perspective that are important for understanding the international dimension of the productivity puzzle. John, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. So let me make just a couple of high level points to start. Um, first, how big is the UK specific productivity puzzle? Uh, by the productivity puzzle, of course, I mean the shortfall of productivity growth after, say, 2007, we can discuss the date. Uh, my answer, based on a recent working paper with Robert Inklar, is the UK specific puzzle is pretty small. From a conditional convergence perspective, you would expect all countries to grow at the same rate in steady state. After all, ideas flow across borders. Uh, even if imperfectly. You know, but of course, depending on frictions, barriers, uh, institutions, uh, countries might have different levels of productivity. So what Robert and I find is that in 2007, UK market economy total factor productivity was 89% of the level of the US market economy uh, TFP. By 2019, so a decade later, uh, right before the pandemic, UK market economy TFP was about 85% of the US level. So the UK had lost ground between 2007 and 2019 by about 4% or three tenths of a percent per year. That to me is the UK specific aspect of the productivity puzzle. Uh, you know, and three tenths of a percent is pretty modest. It's not that hard to explain with uh, industry stories or even uh, you know, measurement issues. Now, second, the reason the UK specific puzzle looks small is because the UK uh, productivity slowdown is in the context of a broader advanced economy productivity slowdown. Now, the United States has long been taken as the frontier economy, and it's not really that puzzling, I think. You know, it's, it's unfortunate, but not that puzzling that US TFP growth 
has been only modest since, say, 2005. That's around when I would put the date. After all, in the past half century, since the early 1970s, US TFP growth has mostly been pretty modest. It's pretty, sim pretty, mo pretty similar in the 70s, 80s, early 90s to what we've seen in the past 15 years. The decade from 95 to 2005 was the exception when the explosion of uh, you know, ICT, the internet, you know, the rise of Walmart led to a temporary productivity boom. There was never a guarantee that the pickup in US TFP growth would persist, and it didn't. So if the pace of frontier productivity growth slows, it would be surprising if growth in the UK and elsewhere did not slow. Now, finally, this doesn't mean the UK should simply settle for slow productivity growth. After all, the key to faster growth at this point is, uh, you, know, you can hope the frontier speeds up, but you can also complete the convergence process to not settle for being stuck at 85 or 90% of the US TFP level. Uh, now, from 95 to 2007, UK market sector TFP was actually converging somewhat towards US levels. What Robert and I find in our paper is that overall convergence was driven by essentially complete convergence in market services. US and U, uh, UK market service TFP levels have been essentially equal in our uh, data since the mid 2000, uh, the mid 2000, around 2005. So the low hanging fruit probably isn't in market services. Where there remains a sizable levels gap uh, in our data is in manufacturing. The level of manufacturing TFP in the UK, and for that matter in Northern Europe are pretty similar, but are only about 80% of the US level. Uh, so that's where there's clear scope to catch up. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there uh, and we can continue in questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, John. Very helpful and exceptionally clear. Chiara, could I turn to you now? Hi. Uh, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so let me perhaps take it from, from when uh, John started. And, and let me slightly disagree uh, uh, from, from his uh, sort of point of view. Uh, we know that the UK in productivity level is still 14.1% touch point uh, higher than uh, the average OECD productivity levels. But this is about half of what other uh, comparable economies have in terms of productivity, take France, 37.5 percentage point, US, 36, Sweden, et cetera. And the worst news, I would say, that relative to these countries where the, the gap has actually increased relative to the, uh, to the early 2000s, in the UK, this gap uh, has actually lost about six percentage points from 20.8 in 2000. So the news is actually not very good in terms of level productivity level. And if you look at TFP growth, there has been a significant slowdown, which I think is quite typical uh, to the UK and quite specific to the UK, that has gone from about 1.5 uh, percentage point, uh, sorry, 1.5% uh, for the MFP growth before the crisis. So, uh, between 2000 and 2007 to about 0.02% uh, after 2010. So we really see a significant slowdown and, and this, this level of slowdown is very much specific to the UK. The question I think is this something that is due to the sectoral composition, something that John was alluding to, or is this something that we find this explanation within uh, the sectors? And, and the answer is that while sectoral Composition of the UK economy can explain something with sectors like IT and financial explaining some of the slowdown. Most of the slowdown has happened within sectors. So there, uh, I hope we get to the, uh, to the next discussion in, in trying to explain what can explain the slowdown within sector. Is this something that can be explained by the performance of firms a different level of the productivity distribution is this something that can be explained by uh, reallocation. So I hope we get to that and, and uh, I leave the floor back to you. Again. Thank you very much, Chiara. Um, Chad, could I bring you in now to say hello? Good afternoon, Chad. Good afternoon, thank you. It's, it's uh, a pleasure to be here speaking with you today uh, about this very important issue. Um, I, to follow on what John and Chiara said, I think it is, it, it, on one hand, it's, it's useful to 
work with this bifurcation between what's going on at the frontier and what's going on with the gap between where the UK is and the frontier. And I think both things are important and understanding both mechanisms is very relevant to the UK productivity issue. Um, as John said, there's solid evidence that the frontier has slowed down for let's say the last 15 years or so. Productivity growth in almost every high income and many middle income countries has, has slowed. Um, and of course that's, that's bad news for everybody. We'd really like to turn the dial up on productivity growth. The thing is, of course, if it were that easy, everyone would have done it because it loosens a lot of constraints and difficult choices when productivity growth is faster. So the question is, what can be done? And I'm sure we're going to visit about the details on that today. So I'll, I'll leave the details to that. But if I just um, leave my opening statement with, with, a, with what the optimistic case for either acceleration on the frontier or acceleration in the catch-up uh, component what it would look like. I think there's two components and they're not mutually exclusive stories. Um, one is that there is a, a large stock of newly developed technologies, IT certainly, but beyond that, biomedicine, um, energy, other, other examples. Um, and this large stock is, is sort of ripe for exploitation, for harnessing uh, in a way that uh, is unusual or hasn't been available in, let's say, a couple decades. Um, we don't have super hard metrics on this, but I think there's a reasonable case to be made that sort of the, the potential uh, of existing technology is as high as it's been in a while. So I think that that's one thing to, to keep in mind. The other component is, and we're dealing with it very vividly right now, is the COVID pandemic. Um, no one would have wished for it, but the fact is it came, out, came in and really forced a lot of changes in the way things are done uh, by a lot of producers. Those are disruption costs, of course, um, but what they have done is, I think, forced a reckoning of how uh, producers produce. And now as the pandemic hopefully recedes, um, there's an option available. The things that worked well before and will continue to work now, we can return to. The things that we've learned new ways to do and better, this sort of has sort of knocked us out of that old equilibrium that we might have been stuck in, a, which was at its inception optimal, but became suboptimal. We can get out of that and move to new ways of doing things that will hopefully be more productive. If you squint, and I'm reluctant to squint this hard because of how noisy the data is, the early returns in labor productivity in the U.S. look pretty good coming out of the, coming out of the uh, last couple of years. And again, that's really early. I hate to rely on anything less than five years of data in productivity statistics. So I say that with a lot of uh, caution. But in any case, I think that's the, nat the nature of the second case for optimism. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Chad. Well, it's certainly good to have some optimism. I think we need more optimism, if I could say that. Bertha, good afternoon. Thanks for joining. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, so let me think about the broader picture. So trade and FDI have substantial impact on productivity. This impact works through multiple channels. But here, let me just focus on one particular channel, access to foreign markets. So point number one. Access to foreign markets create incentives for firms to invest in productivity enhancing measures and in innovation. And the mechanism is very simple. If you can spread the fixed cost of investment over a larger market, you are more likely uh, to undertake this investment because you are selling a larger number of units. And there is evidence supporting this mechanism. There is um, work by Treffler and Lee Leva showing that Canadian firms um, that were producing products that saw improved access to the US markets were more likely to undertake such investments. Um, they improved labor productivity. They were more likely to adopt sophisticated, sophisticated manufacturing um, techniques um, and invest in innovation. 
Point number two, anticipated future policy changes lead to actions today. And there is theoretical literature on this. Um, there is also empirical evidence showing that firms invest prior to entry into foreign markets. They improve the quality of products prior to introducing them into foreign markets. Point number three, the same argument applies to services. So think about a consulting firm that develops a new supply management tool, some sort of procedures, data collection, uh, computer system. If this firm can sell this tool to multiple clients, uh, they are willing to undertake this initial investment that may be substantial. If on the other hand, the number of possible clients is limited, they are not going to do that. Now, and this point about um, service, the market access being important for services is particularly important in the context of the UK, uh, where services account for about three quarters of GDP. Point number four, um, globally, we've made much more progress in opening markets for goods than in opening markets for services. Um, and, um, and if you think about um, barriers, the barriers are quite substantial. And here, uh, I am a big fan of the Services Trade Restrictiveness Index that was produced by OECD. And that index, for instance, documents barriers to services exporters um, when they are selling to the European economic area from within the EEA versus from outside. And the difference in market access between members and non-members is substantial. And of course, the implication of that is that having left the single market, um, UK may, this leaving the single market may translate into lower productivity growth in services firms in the future. Point number five, the mere threat of facing higher barriers to services exports has already uh, induced UK firms to act today. If you look at travel to work areas and if you um, calculate their exposure to barriers to services exports. And you can do this by looking at a share of employment that in professional services sectors, tradeability of those sectors, as well as the threat of barriers. So comparing this OECD index that captures European policy for vis-a-vis -vis European nations versus outsiders. Um, what you will see is the travel to work areas with greater exposure to those barriers have already reduced online vacancy postings today relative to less exposed travel to work areas. And if you analyze the timing of that, um, if you look at the long period that happened after the referendum, but if you zoom in on quarter by quarter information, you see that that happened after invocation of Article 50, that was the first downward jump. And the second downward jump was after the publication of the government's white paper in July 2018, uh, where um, future of the future trading relationship, desired future trading relationship with the EU was spelled out and the desired future relationship was free trade in good, but looser relationship in services with the freedom for the UK to chart its own path, meaning regulatory divergence. So to close, uh, what does it all imply? What's the bottom line? Is The bottom line is that um, foreign policy, and in particular, obtaining access to foreign markets is one of the levers governments have if they want to stimulate domestic productivity growth. Thank you. Thank you, Beata. That was uh, exceptionally clear and very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, I found that last 20 minutes or so um, a wonderful springboard for us to continue now our examination of, of each of the witnesses in turn. Um, I'd like to turn to Chris Pizzeridis, who's going to 
ask John uh, Fennell some questions to begin with. Uh, we want to sort of open this up to the extent to which, um, if after Chris has asked some of his first questions, if other commissioners want to come in, they're very welcome. But also, uh, we'll have to be careful how we handle this. But if 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 Beata Chad um, uh, and Chiara want to add something else to something John has said, we'll try to leave a gap at the end of the twenty minutes or so we've allocated. If there's anything you want to come back on in in a in a either single-handed or double-handed sense, either a clarification or something you disagree with. Uh, very happy to do that. So we'll try and structure it that way. And please forgive us if it doesn't quite work out. I'm sure it will, but we'll, we'll try our best. Chris. Okay, thank you, Jack. Uh, Jack, um, you, just, you said brief introductions. I'm Chris Bisseridis, professor at the London School of Economics and the University of Cyprus, where I am at present. I'm not speaking to you from the University of Cyprus now, from my home in Cyprus, in case you see a bed behind me and you think that the University of Cyprus provides beds for in-depth professors. <laughs> no, they don't. Um, okay, well, it's, nice, it's, it's very nice to see you, uh, John. I think I, I probably taught you in an earlier age at the London School of Economics, right, <laughs> at, the, at the MSc. Um, as you know, I'm a uh, macroeconomist, and I think in terms of, um, very conventional macros. I'm going to ask you a very, uh, you might say, naive question. You know, when you, you know when we write down an aggregate, I mean, we calculate product, labor productivity by dividing output by labor, basically, simply. But we do it all on the basis of an aggregate production function, and that aggregate production function has mainly three inputs: is the quality of the human capital, the level of new investment, is the technology. You know what gives you TFP and what new investment. If we want to be more sophisticated we add organizational capital. Now, if I ask you to tell me the main drivers of UK productivity growth, and in particular, what's uh, slowing the UK down, do you, do you think you can put it in, in this framework? I mean, do you think you can put your finger on one of these four inputs, if you like, and tell me that's where the UK fails? So, I mean, the, the challenge, one organizational Capital is a challenge because uh, you know our measurements just are not very good. Uh, to the extent we have organizational capital measures, you know the uh, the intent invest that doesn't look like that changed a lot. It looks like uh, by those measures, intangible investments are lower than in the UK or Northern Europe as a level as a share of GDP. But uh, that doesn't look like there was a dramatic change in that investment rate. So. That does not look like the answer uh, to your on your final point. So, in terms of uh, then, is it human capital, kind of labor quality, or is it a capital deepening? Uh, I would, I think, for most, you know, for major advanced economies, I'm looking at the U.S., I'm looking at the U.K., I'm looking at Northern Europe. What slowed down really was TFP. Now, you have to be careful with capital because capital is endogenous, right? If you have a slowdown in TFP. Uh, you're going to change uh, the growth rate of the capital labor ratio. You know, capital will respond endogenously. So the way, at least in recent papers, I've been trying to look at that is by looking at the capital output ratio. Um, and for the, you know, and in none of these countries do you see a change in the capital. You know, do you see a decline in the capital output ratio after 2005, 2007? You, what you see is a, a sharp slowdown in TFP growth. Uh, and then that, in my mind, induces a slowdown in desired capital of firms. Uh, and so it's going to, you know, in my, in my view, the, the investment part of, this, of what we saw, we saw weak investment, but that, to my, in my mind, was mainly the endogenous response, or at least was plausibly the endogenous response to the slowdown in TFP. So if I'm looking, you know, the data that Robert and I looked at uh, in a recent paper uh, was, you know, for the US, the BEA, BLS, uh, uh, a joint data set, and the UK uh, was the ONS data. And you know, you know, you know, the UK slowed from growing 1.6% TFP growth, 95 to 2007 in the market economy to minus 0.2%. So it was a huge slowdown, and Chiara was pointing that out. I mean, in these data, the UK market economy slowed 1.8% in terms of its TFP growth. But the US slowed by a percentage point. From 1.1 in these data to 2.1, and so you know, so there was a sharper slowdown in the UK, but that's because the UK was catching up before 95 because market services and our data were catching up. There was no presumption to me that once the UK 
close the gap in market services, it would keep converging. So to me, the right counterfactual is, what if it had stayed at the same level of TFP as the US? In which case, you know, you're looking at, a, you know, the US slowed, you know, 1%, the UK slowed 1.8, but 0.5 of that was the end of convergence. Uh, so to me, the residual shortfall is mainly coming, you know, uh, for the UK is that three tenths. The rest is the end of convergence uh, that, you know, which the process needs, we want that to continue, but it stopped and uh, the global slowdown. Okay, thank you. Well, that, well, that's very interesting. So I take it to be the solo residual then. <laughs> yes. It's yes. simple. Uh, okay, very good. I, I mean, we don't talk, we, we do talk about um, slowdown. You, you probably answered when the slow started, in fact, both now and in, in your introductory remarks. Now, what, um, I mean, what I find is strange when I hear people talk, what I don't understand is that they say it's, it, it's a puzzle, you know, like, and, and, I'm, and I wonder often, why, why is it a puzzle? I mean, I, I, I would call it a puzzle if everything um, seemed to be good of the factors to have given you and what you discussed, but then the final outcome is not good. In other words, if, we, if I think in terms of Samuelson's sausage machine, you can see how old I am, but I remember this. <laughs> what, what you put in the sausage machine is good, but the sausage that comes out is inedible. That's what I would call a puzzle. Do, do, do we have such a thing in the UK? I mean, I, I don't see that somehow. Well, I have, I have tended not to call it a puzzle. Uh, of course, I started on this talk, talking about the US case and why did US TF, why did US TFE growth slow after in the US 2004, 2005, you could make an argument for early 2006, uh, but somewhere around there. Uh, well, for me, I mean, the US TFE growth since world, you know, as long as we have good data, which I would take back to World War II, looks like a regime shift model. We had very fast TFE growth, slow TFE growth, then, then it slowed after the early 70s and was slow until the mid 90s. We got the internet, you know, the ICT revolution, we got to jump up for a decade. And then we went back to roughly where we were before the 95 pickup. Um, now, why does it look that way? You can tell stories. Why didn't we get more from the, uh, what we saw from uh, you know, in the 95 to 2005 period? Uh, it could be, you know, could be you know, Chad's, Chad's point, we just have to wait. It could be that the internet revolution and, and you know, the ICT revolution uh, sowed the seeds of its own demise in some way. I mean, that would be say, you know, a couple stories that the Aguillon at all story is like that, where you get a, a temporary boost in the level of, of productivity, but then incent, you know, but then eventually, you know, every every you know product area has a high productivity firm. Incentives to innovate go down because it's uh, you know the if you try to if you try to compete, you're going to be competing against someone uh, innovative. Your profits are going to be low. Uh, so their story, you know, is is one in which. Uh, it's perfectly understandable, and it was from the dynamics of innovation itself. So when then I look at other countries. Well, you know, if the frontier is slowing. Everyone's going. You know, frontier is going. You know, the pace of potential growth is going to slow everywhere. Uh, and you know, Europe in general was converging towards the U.S. You know, from below, from you know, for you know, a lot, while after World War II, so it could grow fast. But once it reaches its steady state, it's going to grow at roughly the pace of the frontier. That's how I'm thinking about it. Yeah. We can, of course, try to get the, you know, catch up further. Uh, we can try to think about policies to advance the frontier. But to me, it's not necessarily, I don't view it as a, I don't view it, I view it as an unfortunate, but not necessarily a puzzle. Okay, well, I'm, I'm turning has a point, but I, I have another question that is not directly related to this. So I don't know, may, maybe I'll ask you quickly because it might be a little bit unfair asking you that question, but I want to see if you have a view. <laughs> And, and that's, and then we'll go back to Anton. Now, I mean, you know that there are big differences within the UK. You know, I, I mean, London and the Southeast, they're almost like different country from uh, Newcastle and, and Sunderland in the Northeast, for example. And um, one, one view in the UK, I think it's one that uh, has been put forward by my colleagues in the geography department at the LSE, is that the reason is that um, the best quality uh, human capital leaves those areas and migrates 
And that's basically the reason that uh, pay is less, uh, research is less, incentives are not good enough uh, to innovate and, and all that. And another one, which um, I, I suspect someone that I, I can see in one of these windows holds, but I'm not going to give any names, <laughs> is that no, there isn't much migration. There are other reasons that give these regional inequalities. Now, it concerns me a lot because I, I, I'll express a kind of self-interest in that my, my current big project on the UK is, is on regional inequalities and, and leveling up and all that, you know, it's funded by the Enough Foundation, um, the future of work. So I wonder if you have a view about that. Not necessarily an informed view. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, because I've, I've thought less about that. I mean, but obviously there's, there, are region, there are important regional inequalities everywhere. If you're looking at the US, you're looking at France, whatever. I mean, uh, I, I think the, I mean, you, maybe it's larger, more important in the UK, um, but that's, it's a matter of degree. Um, you know, one argument in the US, I mean, the US, you also see people moving from, you know, people with skills, you know, they're gonna get a higher return in uh, big cities. Uh, you know, Shea and Moretti would argue the problem is, uh, uh, the, and the, the policy prescription is what you need is land use reforms in New York and San Francisco where workers are more productive uh, so that you can add housing and more people can move there. Um, that, that per se, of course, does not help the, you know, the low wage areas per se, it just makes it easier for people to leave low productivity regions. Um, so uh, I'm certainly not an expert on place-based policy, so I think I will stop there. Okay, well, thank you very much. And I thought it might not be fair asking you because you don't live in the UK, but uh, I just wondered whether you came across in your paper. Well, Anton wanted to ask something, so why don't I pass on to him? Thanks, Chris. Anton Moscatelli, University of Glasgow. Um, John, just on this point of of, of endogeneity of the of what happens to investment in uh, in around that period, um, I wonder if you wanted to could expand expand on that a bit. I mean, some people think it's not a coincidence that this happened around the time when, you know, there was a great financial crisis. There was essentially uh, interest rates were were driven to a very low point. And there's something around the dynamics of, of firms exit out of markets, which might have impact on all of this. Do you want to expand a bit on that? Because you touched on some of this in, 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 your, in your paper uh, with uh, Robert Inclar and uh, you know, what other forces may be at play here? So, I mean, one of the, you know, so if, I, if I'm looking at uh, the UK, uh, TFP growth looks like it slowed down after, t at, 2007, right? At 2008, it was slower. Uh, in the US, it was a few years earlier than that. Um, now, one of the challenges with differentiating a story in which it's, you know, my story in which it's, you know, kind of the frontier slows uh, and then everyone else is going to slow uh, is, and it was the financial crisis, is that, you know, there's no reason that the slowdown is going to be at the same time. Uh, you know, the IMF has found evidence that TFP will slow, you know, with a, those after, you know, when the frontier, when US TFP changes, other, you know, industry TFP and other countries changes with a lag of a few years. So the timing would then be very similar uh, between my story, you know, which hits with the UK with a lag of a few years and the financial crisis. Um, but if you, you know, if you do, you know, the conventional growth accounting in terms of capital labor ratios, you're going to find that capital, you know, was an additional contributor because the capital labor ratio grew more slowly. Um, but you're still going to find TFP was the biggest part of that. Um, now, uh, you know, if you're looking within industries, you're going to, you do find that, you know, UK fin financial sector was a drag on aggregate TFP growth, uh, which could well have been, you know, even on relative terms, it did worse than the US, but it's a, it's a larger share of the economy as well in the UK. Um, and an even larger share relative to Europe. Um, uh, you know, so you know, some of the financial sector stories could well matter. In my mind, it was kind of an additional factor that could have, you know, that potentially could affect, you know, kind of relative, uh, you know, some of the idiosyncratic components uh, in a country rather than the, you know, as opposed to the aggregate uh, that everyone experienced. Um, but in my mind, you know, I can't find much evidence that that's a very large effect uh, in the in the UK. Um, you know, I you find the cap, you know, what you find in recessions is capital ratio output ratios go up and then they gradually come back. The UK is above 
its pre-recession trend in terms of the capital output ratio as of 2019. There was no short, no, no evidence of a decline in that. That to me is more consistent with, you know, TFP slows down, it, it, in, you know, investment opportunities slow down, you're gonna get less uh, investment. Thank you, John. Um, I think that Beata and Chiara want to come in um, either on this point or something else that John may have said in response to Chris or Anton. So perhaps I could just bring you in the order. I saw the hands go up first, Beata, then Chiara. Um, thank you. Just a related point. So looking forward, the question is, will the UK be able to take advantage of the accelerated digitalization we have ob observed? And some of the issues have been mentioned in the opening statement. Um, I don't know the answer, but I think it's quite instructive to look at job vacancies that have been posted before and after the pandemic. And in particular, to look at job vacancies for managers and to check what share of, the, of those job ads require special digital skills. By special digital skills, I mean things such as administering ICT systems, um, developing animations or Oracle or Python skills. So if you do such an exercise, uh, you will notice that since the pandemic started, a third of job postings for managers in Germany asked for specialized digital skills. And there was a very visible significant jump at the beginning of, of the pandemic. So it was sort of, a, in a sense, a temporary increase in demand. If you look at the UK, only less than a fifth of job ads ask for such specialized digital skills. And there was absolutely no reaction, no change after the pandemic. Thank you. Well, I don't know if you want to answer that first, then we'll go to Chiara. Oh, I didn't think that was a, a question uh, yeah. for me. I think it's a very, it's a, an interesting and important stylized fact. Uh, I mean, to, I mean, to Chad, Chad's point earlier in the, you know, in labor productivity during the pandemic, uh, I think it's very hard to know whether that, what, from the aggregate numbers, how to interpret it, uh, uh, because, you know, in the UK saw a spike in labor productivity during the pandemic. So did the US. Uh, it's been very good. But it looks in the U.S. It looks very similar to what you saw in uh, the U in the Great Recession. You know, ten years ago, or eleven, perhaps eleven years ago, we we're thinking, well, maybe the Great Recession has led to these great opportunities and possibilities. And then we had, and then it was undone. We we didn't get. You know, we had then a decade of very weak growth. In the U.K., it hasn't been in TFP growth. It's been, uh, you know, in, in the according to the ONS, it's entirely been like capital deepening and and labor quality purposes. Lower skilled workers lose jobs, and because of uh, immigrants leaving. Um, and so to Beata's point, I mean, I think looking forward is an, is an important question of whether the UK is going to be able to, uh, you know, if it, what it needs to get back to faster growth is get back on the convergence path. This is not promising. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chiara, I think you, did you want to- I, I just wanted to add something about mm. uh, the slowdown in TFP growth and, and what Fritz called, uh, you know, uh, the solar residual. I mean, some of the solar residual you can measure, uh, you know, with innovation or proxies for innovation like R&D and, and patents. And there, I think there is evidence that, you know, the UK has lost ground uh, already. You know, I, I was looking at it actually a couple of days ago. And, and, and if you look at the 19, 1995, let's say it's the year where uh, the UK was at par with the rest of the OECD in terms of, R&D uh, over GDP, uh, sort of, you know, uh, sorry, GDP spent on R&D, so about 1.8%. Uh, and then when you look over time, you see that the UK is now, you know, in the latest uh, data for 2018, for example, 1.75%, and the rest of the OCD is 2.4%. And similarly, this is, you know, R&D, if you want, is a measure of input into the innovation process and investment in innovation. When you look at output, for example, measure as patent per employee, you also see a similar sort of loss relative to the rest of, of the CD economy. 
one other input that one can look at is, is the quality of the workforce. And there again, uh, you know, there has been, according to PIAC data, you know, the UK, I think is, is characterized by two things, uh, dispersion in, in the quality, which is something that, you know, has been discussed a lot in the UK, but also an average worsening of literacy and numeracy skill in the younger cohorts of worker relative to the older co cohorts, which is something that seems kind of at odds with the rest of, of OECD economies where older workers are actually worse off in terms of literacy and numeracy relative to younger workers. So, you know, I think in terms of this unmeasured input of, or into the production uh, processes, you see some worsening, you know, both in terms of innovation, proxy of, of TFP, and in terms of uh, quality of the workforce. So I just wanted to add to what John uh, was saying on this. Thank you very much, Chiara. I'm just going to bring Bart in for one final question in this session. But before, I wonder if I could just follow up uh, with John um, on this question of whether the COVID pandemic has, has helped UK productivity in, in some way or other. I mean, our impression is that this is a one-off, as much a one-off compositional effect with low productivity workers falling out of the labour force temporarily with higher productivity workers being able to continue their work and potentially putting in more effort during a crisis, leading to some temporary increase in productivity. And I think this is where it comes back to Beata's point in a way, is that will that compositional effect kind of be amplified and persist in terms of those higher productivity areas, but managing to draw in more higher productivity activity in a more persistent manner, or will it go back to the way it was? I think that's what we were trying to, trying to get at with that, that direction of questioning. I'd like your, your sense on that. And that's quite different to the kind of traditional recession model we might have in our mind with particular firms disappearing, new firms coming in. This is, this is a, a, a kind of sorting or compositional shock that's going on. And we're wonder, wondering a little bit about the dynamic tendency for it to persist or not. That's something you can help us think about a bit, John. Right. Obviously, at this, at this point, this is all, maybe even as Chad suggested, this is, that's a bit speculative. Uh, and yeah. you're, you're getting into, you know, you know, I agree with Chad's point. You have an, there's an option value. We've learned new things. Um, you know, one of those, of course, is that you know maybe to uh, Chris's earlier point. You know, you can have worker. You know, high skilled workers don't necessarily need to move to uh, you know to London or to the the productivity you know the the high productivity place in order to take advantage of their skills and benefit from their skills. You know, that that offers that offers an opportunity, but you know at the same time, is it Going to be a large, you know, is it how big is it? We, you know, I think we don't know, and it, and that is largely a level effect, uh, as you're saying. Um, Thank you, John. I, so, I, you know, so I'm 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 skeptical that it's a big change in the growth rate because I'm skeptical that there are big changes in the incentives to innovate coming from the, you know, because of the changes in the pandemic in ways that would you know, affect growth. There can be level effects. Thank you, John. Beata, you want to come in again? Is that is that further clarification on this question or or a different question? Because that, then it should be Bart. This one. Fine, please. If, if I may, apologies to Bart. Um, you <laughs> know, one factor that played a role is workers feeling more productive when working from home, and that's what all the surveys of people working from home show. And it's quite interesting that this is true in advanced economies as well as in emerging Europe vast majority of people um, report being equally productive or even more productive. So that would speak to the level effect John mentioned. Thank you, Beata. Bart. No, this is fine <clears throat> because um, my question really is a bit of a wrap up question for this session. John, I, I much appreciate your paper together with Robert because it really helps us to sharpen up the debate. I think we should take offline the discussion about endogeneity, which is a very important point that you're making, and it does make a difference in how you think about it. But we are a policy group here together. We try to think in the longer term about policy. So I want to have, have you wrap up this session by, and, and I really, I have to, I have the benefit of having a look at your paper ahead of time. So I want to quote you what you're saying in the paper, uh -oh. putting the emphasis on TFP. You're saying stories that primarily focus on capital deepening are, in our view, focus on a secondary symptom rather than a primary driver of growth. So what is the policy implication of that? 
uh, it's the policy implication of that that we should worry about all the thousand pieces of the productivity puzzle but not worry too much about this low investment rate because in effect that's just an effect of all this low tdp growth and if that's the case it really changes the nature of the discussion in the uk quite a bit because we're then saying that sort of very slow investment rate that we've had for such a long time isn't the core issue to focus on we need to get all this other stuff right uh, and then investment will follow i mean i'm i'm, sh I'm putting this a little bit blunt and i'm sure that's not what you meant to say but i I just want you to speculate a little bit about what will the policy implication of this paper be, because it will be quite an important uh, contribution to the policy discussion. Right. I mean, UK investment has been lower than, you know, as a share of GDP has been lower than in the US or you know, Northern Europe for since 1990 or something like that. Um, so that's longstanding. That obviously is going to matter, you know, for the level of labor productivity as opposed to the level of TFP, you know, can be related, but uh, but the capital deepening channel is going to give less. You know, it's going to suggest that you know, the, the UK labor productivity could be further from the frontier than the level of U UK TFP. And I think that's consistent with the work you've done in the past uh, and that Robert had done in the past. We did not per se look at the level. Um, so the question, but, but as you're saying, the question is why is investment low? Is it because there's some frictions to investment? Or is it because of other aspects of institutions, uh, dynamism, uh, innovation uh, that ultimately drive investment, both in physical capital and in organizational capital and in R&D and the like? Um, and to me, that's where I, I would focus more on getting all of these, getting the institute. You know, personally, I would I would lean toward focusing on getting the institutions right uh, and that will promote. Good growth. Some of it is, you know, having you know the right the right skills. Some of it is ensuring you have the right competitive environment. You know, which you know, as Beata said in her introductory com comments, uh, you know, that's a challenge. Uh, and, and and Brexit makes it more challenging. Uh, uh, you know, it, you know, uh, by a competitive environment, I mean one that encourages appropriate, uh, you know, creative destruction. Um, uh, but that that is that's where I would focus because we know there's a gap in the level of TFP. Thank you, John. Before we go on to the next section, I just are there, are there any very brief additional comments that Beata Chad or Chiara would like to make um, on on this? I guess this TFP has dominated this last twenty minutes or so. Just to the say that I completely no. agree with, with John, and and I would just add, you know, some policies that also help translate the excellence in university with excellence in, in innovation in businesses. And, and, and that I think is, is part of, uh, should be part of the policy, you know, toolkit that the government puts in place. Because that I think is, is a big question. I, I suspect uh, promoting the excellence in universities is not something this commission is going to disagree with. Uh, Beata. <laughs> um, I think we need to tap into the female pool of talent and in particular, we should be encouraged, encouraging girls uh, to study STEM subjects. You know, if you look at the gap between boys and girls uh, in math scores, UK has a higher gap um, than Nordic countries. Now, in fairness, the gap is comparable to Western Europe. Now, and I would argue that this gap is due to the system, the culture, actively discouraging girls from studying mathematics and science. And there is a very instructive study that was done on Germany. Um, it compared math scores in former East German part and in the former West German part. And you know, socialism got many things wrong, but one thing that it got right was gender equality. And you see that girls do better in, East, in former East Germany than in former West Germany. And when the researchers, Claudia Senek and her co-author, dig deeper into this, it's due to social norms, to ambitions, to expectations. Thank you. Exceptionally valuable point. Thank you, Beata, for reminding us of that. Um, I'd like to turn now, if I may, to uh, Rachel Lomax, who will take the lead in questioning or getting some evidence from Chiara Krishola. Rachel, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, 
my background is primarily as a policymaker, both in the UK government um, and the Bank of England and briefly in the World Bank. Um, I just, and, and the, the core discipline there is to try and def define the problem that you're trying to solve. And I, I just would like to go back there for uh, Kiara, if, if we may, to the beginning, the way that uh, um, John posed the problem. And basically he seemed to be saying that there really wasn't much of a productivity puzzle, UK specific productivity puzzle. I wasn't sure whether you were disagreeing with him or whether you were saying the same thing in a different way. And I wonder if you could just clarify, uh, you know, is there a disagreement with John or do you just think it's more useful to look at the elephant from the other side? Okay. I, I hate disagreeing with John, so I shouldn't say that I disagree with John. I mean, my point- Please, is please do, Chiara, please do, it's don't feel- I, The point <laughs> I was trying to make is perhaps, I, I, I wouldn't want to limit uh, the comparison with the US and with the frontier, but perhaps with other uh, countries in Europe that uh, actually did perform uh, much better than the UK. And I would also add that the big difference when I look at growth rates, uh, the big you know gap opened after uh, the global financial crisis. So that that's the point I was trying to make. That yes, there was a slowdown, and, and and I mean I think this is a point that, in a way, is reassuring for the UK in some respects because some of the patterns that we see in the UK in productivity, in concentration, uh, in markups and so on and so forth are quite similar to other countries. So uh, that I, I fully agree with John, but there has been this bigger drop, uh, I would say in productivity uh, growth, especially relative to other European countries that to me is a bit of the UK uh, puzzle. So there is some disagreement perhaps, but just I think in, in the comparison group, I'm, I'm not just looking at the US. Uh, okay, so could you just, just can we just pursue that a little bit more? I mean, basically what John was saying was that the UK had gone backwards a bit as far as convergence was concerned. Uh, which countries would you say have gone in the other direction? I mean, presumably all Western European countries are converging on the frontier. <laughs> I don't think anybody, apart from small corners of bits of countries, uh, is really uh, outperforming the US, are they? So which countries ought we to be uh, um, uh, have, have outperformed us in that respect, and can we draw any any inferences from that? So, if if I look in in relative terms, uh, uh, in the levels, uh, I mean the Nordic countries, uh, Denmark, uh, Sweden, uh, and even Finland are sort of uh, at a higher level than the UK but also you know, Germany and France. So if, if I compare uh, the UK with those in levels that what I see, and then when we look really at this, at this TFP growth after the crisis, which in, in, in the UK is basically zero, you know, we have an annual uh, TFP growth of 0 0.02, then you know, it, it's, I would say, you know, uh, Canada, France, Germany, uh, even you know, uh, Spain is doing better and the US is still doing better than, than the UK. So many, many countries are, are doing better and I'm happy to share the numbers with the... Uh, with the so so, so basically, you know, we, we were slightly unusual in going backwards as far as convergence exactly. is concerned, whereas other ones didn't go yeah. backwards. I mean, can, I, can I ask you to develop um, something that you said and John said in different ways. I mean, John located uh, the, the sort of gap, particularly in manufacturing. You talked a bit about the sectoral composition of productivity slowdown and also uh, the, the, the within firm uh, thing. Could you, could you just talk a little bit about those issues? Because, you know, get under the hood of what might have been happening in the last few years. Yeah. So, let me start with the sector. Uh, so I think the slowdown, when, when we look at the number, was uh, quite broad based. So there was a slowdown across uh, all sectors. Uh, slightly stronger, I would say, in the 
you know, financial uh, services sector and, and the uh, IT uh, services sector. When, uh, but as I said, it, it was quite broad based. So I, I don't think the sectoral uh, explanation of the slowdown can really be the main explanation of the slowdown. That's why I was mentioning the within uh, sector component, which might be uh, perhaps explaining a bit more. Uh, and, and in particular, I, I agree with John, try to look at the drivers of MFP and, and you know, looking at innovation, looking at uh, skills and so on. So uh, let me perhaps explain the, the reasoning here is that you know, when we, when we look at aggregate uh, productivity growth, one could sort of distinguish between, uh, you know, the within firm productivity performance and the capacity of the economy of reallocating resources to the more productive firms. Uh, and when we look at the within component, and, and Chad, I'm sure, will say much more about this, we need to take into account that, you know, not, we don't have an average firm in the UK. We have like a you know, many different firms. There is a, a huge heterogeneity even within sectors. Now, we have done the study in a comparative way for many countries. And if you compare the uh, top performing firms in a sector with the worst performing firm, you have an average gap of about, you know, basically tenfold uh, productivity performance at the top relative to the bottom. In the UK, according to numbers, which we have not calculated yet, because we didn't have the data to do so, but the Resolution uh, Foundation uh, has some number and, and they sort of uh, mention like a 16 fold. So the UK seems to have a much larger, uh, you know, heterogeneity than in other countries. What they also show, and again, this might be different from, from other countries, is that according to uh, their analysis of, of ONS data, this, this hasn't increased over time. So there hasn't been this increase in the fat tail uh, or, or you know, of the worst performing firm. You don't see that this so much uh, in, in the UK. If anything, what they seem to show is that there has been a decline in the productivity performance at the top of the distribution. So that might also explain some of the slowdown that fir frontier firms in the UK haven't done as well uh, after the crisis. So that could be one, one explanation. The second question that I was looking for evidence, which again, we didn't have uh, for the UK, but as I said, this is the within uh, story. So you see that the within story combined with the heterogeneity, you see that top performing firms sort of above the median and, and, and above, they have done worse after the, uh, the crisis. The second is the reallocation. And what we see in the UK, I would say is not as clear cut as in other uh, countries. So we look at uh, what has happened to concentration for which we had data as well at UCD uh, using commercial firm level data. And uh, it's, uh, you see that uh, concentration has increased. And then, you know, the big question is what, what's happening to entry and the exit and to job reallocation. And in the UK, I mean, I've looked at different data. Uh, some data tells you that reallocation has actually improved, uh, you know, in the last decades. And some, can, some studies tell you that it has been stable. So that hasn't worsened. And I mean, with data that we have collected during COVID actually, the UK has done particularly well relative for, for countries in, in Southern Europe in terms of entry rates, sort of picking up and entry uh, uh, during the COVID crisis. And also in terms of exit rate, there has been a pickup of exit uh, in, in 2021 that other countries have not done yet, where, where you know, the economy is still frozen. And this increase in, in let me perhaps also connect with what Beata, uh, John and then Chad were saying, this increase in entry seems to be uh, quite strong, uh, you know, for the UK, but also for the US and the Netherlands, especially in online retail, which seems to suggest, again, a change in business model in, in more traditional sectors like uh, retail. But again, this does not seem to be an explanation of the uh, productivity slowdown. So there hasn't been a worsening in, in reallocation as far as one uh, can see from, from the evidence collected by UK 
researchers as, as we didn't have the data ourselves. So it's just a long-standing feature of the UK, basically. Is that what you're saying? Load, I, I'm just standing feature. That, mm. that I mean, I, I do agree with John that uh, you know TFP uh, growth has slowed down, and I'm, I'm trying also to 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 say that this might be more something that is driven by a within firm productivity problem and probably innovation problem. Uh, skill problem, I, I think there is some element of that, but it's not something that is due to reallocation or is not simply due to uh, this sort of fat tail becoming bigger uh, in, in the UK. So if there is a problem, is, is it's in, if it's after the crisis, it's really more among the better firms that have right. performed relatively worse. Uh, and it's something that is not due to the resources uh, not going to the to the more productive firms. Great. Um, John, I saw hand up. I saw your hand up while um, Chiara was talking. You, you seem to have put it down. Is that because she covered your ground or because you just lost the will to live? <laughs> well, the will to intervene. I was just going to say, I was just going to say, I mean, you know, with, with I mean, uh, in the paper with Robert, which Kiara has not seen. Uh, we compare the UK with uh, uh, Northern Europe, uh, which we take as the, you know, the relevant European comparison of you know, France, Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, Finland, where we have industry U uh, data from uh, you know, EU CLEMS that we could you know, compare. So when we build up the market economy, we do find you know, since 2007, they performed fairly similarly to uh, you know, to the UK, they've gone back a little bit, uh, and of course, they unlike the UK, they were losing ground before 2007 uh, in terms of levels. Um, but the slow, you know, the slowdown was a little more pronounced in the UK because the UK was converging before 2007, uh, uh, and it stopped converging and started diverging a little bit. Is there a sectoral element to the convergence? I mean, you singled out manufacturing as where the opportunities for catch up were greatest, but I wasn't <laughs> sure whether that related to, you know, the story of convergence having stalled or whether that was just because manufacturing has always been a bit of a, a back market. Uh, well, in what, in, what we found, in what we found, market services is where the convergence was in the UK. I mean, they, and, and the data we have, you know, and this is using the ONS okay. data, mm -hmm. uh, Market services essentially closed the gap with the U.S. According to you know, using Robert's so this is business levels. and financial services and all that. Yeah, financial services, distribution, professional services. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that's the bit that stalled. Well, that, that goes to the the story of the slowdown in in productivity in that sector since the financial yeah. crisis, doesn't it? Right. Manufacturing right. is just the, when you say there's more opportunities for catch up in manufacturing. That is just because UK manufacturing's always been in that sort of place is it yes and it still is that's where the big level you know the big level gap that you can see i can't is. remember when that wasn't true um <laughs> <laughs> kiara um I'm, I'm conscious that other people oh chris and, and dirt want to come in um chris do you want to yeah I, I actually it was precisely on this point so i i, I it would be a good a good point to come in i, I mean I'm, I'm i'm always puzzled actually when people say that um the UK is 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 in is manufacturing that is at fault and all that because it, it's such a small part of the economy. You know, I mean, I, I think currently it's only about eight percent. So whatever it does, it's not going to show up very much to anything. The the way I see more of the manufacturing, where where it might play a role, is that if, if say you compare UK with Germany or even United States, I, I think Germany is something like fifteen percent or or something. So given that manufacturing TFP growth is high in manufacturing and services, then manufa manufacturing, it, it might be important for the UK because it's a small sector, but it's more of a compositional problem than one within sector. Or rather, well, obviously both exist because within manufacturing, the UK is, is behind. But what matters here is not the within sector, but the between sector, because manufacturing that drives TFP growth at the aggregate is so small as a sector of the economy, then it shows up in the aggregate statistic much more. 
I mean, would you agree with that? Especially, Chiara, especially Chiara, we talked about within and, and between. I mean, now, you see, if you say it's manufacturing where we should be focusing, then you are not really saying that it's going to make a difference if we make UK manufacturing productivity 100% of the frontier. What's going to make a difference is that if we manage to, to double the size of manufacturing in the UK, which is obviously not going to happen. Reversing <laughs> decades of experience, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Even Trump failed to do it in the United States. How can they have a chance, you know? <laughs> so jo John and Chiara, do you want to come back on that challenge? I don't think I would say that we need to uh, increase the size of manufacturing personally. Uh, and, and as I said, I don't think it's a sectoral problem very much. So, you know, and if anything, even if you increase the, you know, I, I agree with Chris, even if you increase the productivity of the manufacturing sector, this will have a small weight, you know, uh, in terms of value added, but then I think even in terms of employment uh, for the aggregate. And I'm not sure you want to go back to bringing uh, back the, the manufacturing in the UK since, you know, like, I mean, to me, it's not a policy that would, uh, would work, I mean, you don't even have the skill, I would say, to, to bring back the, the manufacturing to the UK right now. But I don't know, perhaps John has a different view on that. Over to you, John. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so obviously, obviously, yeah, you know, the, the shared the shares matter uh, and the share, you know, manufacturing is smaller in the in the UK uh, than in uh, continental Europe in particular. Um, but uh, there was more more a point that that's where the gaps are obviously large. When thinking about market services, uh, maybe I, I actually come back to a point of you know, kind of piadas of some of the challenges going forward, uh, where maybe that you know one of the challenges is to not move backwards, uh, and 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 so you know simply staying in the same, you know, simply staying close to the frontier uh, may already be a challenge um, going forward. So I there were obviously there are. A million small aspects, uh, you know, as Bart alluded to already, you know, you know, all of these different, and that's why there are many different, you know, kind of work streams in this uh, general project, uh, and you know, all of them, all of them to some degree, you know, matter. It, so it's more just, uh, uh, is it something? You know, just seeing where the gaps were the largest. That was all I was looking at. Dirk, you had your hand up and it's gone down again. Is is that because your point's passed or again? It, 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 it's okay. It can wait. And um, since we're running out of time a little bit, but it's a yeah. question, I think. So. so so we have one question in the chat from Ying Jin in the, for Chiara, um, which which I will read yeah. out in case you want I, to. I've, I've read it. I've read, read it. it. You so want let to let comment me tell on you that? some time. Uh, I mean, I, I fully agree uh, with the question, uh, I would say, uh, theoretically, in the sense that we do find that, for example, in the work we have done looking at frontier firms, frontier firms are not only multi-sector, are actually multi-country, so they're mainly multinational uh, firms, so they are a different group of firms. Now, let me perhaps say something about the UK data on productivity, especially, where data from the National Statistical Office is not connected at the level of the group. So I, I'm not going to name names, but you know, you don't collect information on the whole group with different sectoral activities for, you know, normally uh, data is collected at the level of uh, entities that operate in, in, in specific sectors, although they are, you know, multi-product firms with, with, which has its own challenges for measurement. So, that I would say is what reassures me when, when I look at uh, comparisons across within sectors or across sectors based on national statistical office data. Let, can I just add something to what Beata and and um, and uh, John said about I think the COVID crisis, but also digitalization and how difficult it is to stay close to the frontier, because we are talking a lot about differences across countries. And again, I think it's important to go a bit more on a micro level about differences across firms within sectors. And I do agree that in the digital era, let's call it, and especially in a post-COVID era, that's going to be a big challenge for everyone to stay close to the frontier, because what we see is that this frontier firms sort of gaining uh, market share, gaining power, 
And I mean, with actually even evidence for the UK suggesting that during COVID, even though everyone is probably adopting and learning how to use digital technology, what has happened is that firms that were already innovative, that were already good with digital technologies, have adopted more and more advanced technology and that, you know, the divide with the rest uh, might be uh, might be becoming even stronger uh, and, and similarly with the telework as well, that they might be benefit more from, from telework. So I think that that's something that it's important to, to know that it's not just across countries, but it's also across firms within sector. Okay, so um, thanks very much, Chiara. I'm very conscious of time. I know there are probably a lot more to be said on this subject, but it perhaps come up in the uh, remaining uh, um, interrogation. So I, I want to hand over now to Dirk, who's going to uh, um, lead the questions for, for Chad. Is that okay? Thanks, Rachel. I will do that. I saw that Cecilia had a her hand up, so perhaps we can give her a moment a little bit later. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure we get some time for you, uh, Cecilia, in a, in a minute, if you, if you don't mind. So we'll, we'll start with Chad. And Chad, I'll, 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 I'll probably have three sets of questions for you. I want to start a little bit with measurement and just to ask a few questions on that. Then I want to go a little bit into what you were talking about earlier on, on technology and intangibles and, and go a little bit into in depth perhaps on that. And then perhaps uh, end up with a few questions on also linking uh, micro to macro, I think, which is something I, I know you've seen your recent paper with Jan de Lurker on, on, on that. So the, the first thing is, is a little bit, I think we've had a, a discussion a little bit about the slowdown. And of course, there's still a lot of people also saying, well, you know, we're, we're just missing it. We're just really not measuring it properly. And I know you did a paper on that, but could you briefly summarize a little bit what your view is on that and what you think, well, this is just nothing there or, or, or is it something we, we need to think about? Sure. So, so first, let's put it on the table. Productivity is a residual. So all mismeasurement in outputs and inputs is called productivity. That's just a fact. So you always have to be mindful of measurement issues when you're talking about productivity. Now, more directly to the question, is mismeasurement a uh, source of the productivity slowdown that's motivated a lot of the discussion, both in the UK and elsewhere. And there, I think the answer is no. And there are many specific points I could make on that. One broad one, I think that's useful to think of at any point, but in particular regard to this question is, if you want to explain a change in productivity growth, a slowdown, for example, as arising from mismeasurement, you need more than to say, ah, there is mismeasurement in productivity, you need to show that there is a change in mismeasurement in a particular direction at a particular time. And there, I think the answer is that's not what happened. I think um, a multiple dimensions, the paper you mentioned, I took a look at, I think basically there's six or seven separate arguments in that paper that just I, I think pretty strongly indicate you, we didn't have a change in mismeasurement in that direction at that particular time. So I think the slowdown is real, that there, that there really is, has been a change in, in total factor productivity that's not tied to measurement. That said, and this segues into the intangibles point that you mentioned, uh, intangibles are a particular source of mismeasurement. And in separate work, um, I've explored how intangibles and sort of waves of intangible investment that one might tie to new technologies can cause a particular pattern in productivity mismeasurement um, that results in a, could result in a slowdown in measured productivity uh, at the cusp of the introduction of a new technology then a later overstatement of productivity growth after the technology's taken hold. Um, and so you can kind of get a wave in measured productivity that, that really doesn't exist there, but it's tied to the introduction of a new technology that might cause a, a, a sustained increase in, in um, true productivity growth. So I think that, I guess I could sum it up as retrospectively what's happened. I don't think we look to mismeasurement as an explanation. Prospectively, as we look at productivity growth going forward, particularly with regard to the potential of these new technologies I mentioned, 
we might want to keep it in mind and whether what we're seeing today or in the next several years is being influenced by the the in uh, productivity measurement issues tied in particular to these these intangibles. Could, could, you, could you just elaborate a little bit on that, Chad? Because I, I, I think, you know, I, I think we all see that there's a lot of technology coming into the economy. We spoke about teleworking a second ago. We spoke about COVID and, and, and so on. But I think also there is an expectation probably that that will feed through uh, relatively quickly. And I think the experience that you're referring to basically said, well, it might come. We just don't know when. And it may take a while longer than we think it would. And also it might initially, I think, decrease productivity for a little while because we're investing so much to to make that happen. I mean, could, could you say a little bit more about that just to, to elaborate a little bit on, on, on the arguments there? Sure, happy to, happy to do that. So the, the basic argument is some new technology be, becomes available. To harness it, uh, producers have to make a lot of associated investments in intangibles they have to reconfigure their organization. They have to retrain their workers to do new things. They have to retrain their customers to do things in a certain way differently than they did before because the way they sell, sell their products is different, et cetera, et cetera. All these, all these changes in the form of production need to be made. Many of those investments are intangible. They're in things that don't go into national accounts as investments. Instead, they go in as um, expenses. You're just paying your workers to do something, and it's that's all going to be expensed in, in the national account. So if you think about conceptually, how, how would we want to treat it? Well, we treat investment in two ways. One, at, initially, it's, it's an output. Companies make, think about you know, the most tangible capital, like a machine. Companies that make the machines, that's called output. Okay, and then some company takes that machine, installs it in their production process, and now it's an input into production. Okay? Well, intangibles work the same way, but we don't measure it like that. So uh, the argument, the mismeasurement argument is initially, you have this new technology that's driving all these intangible investments. What, what's going on there is a lot of output is being made that's not being counted. Firms are throwing resources into creating this intangible stock that should be called an output, but it's not. So initially we are understating the amount of output that's being made, i.e. we are understating the true productivity level. Now later, when those intangible intangibles are put into production processes, they become inputs and they're producing output as inputs. We measure that output, or at least the tangible component of that output, but we're not measuring those intangibles as an input. So what are we doing? We're overstating true productivity at that point because we're not attributing the marginal product of those intangible inputs to those intangible inputs. We're just calling it productivity because we're not, we're not counting those intangibles as inputs at all. So you get this sort of what we call the J curve. It's really a waveform. Initially, productive, measured productivity goes down relative to true productivity because you're under measuring output. Then later, as those intangibles are put into place, you are overstating true productivity growth because you're not attributing the, the marginal product of the intangibles to it. So that, that's, the, that's the tie between mismeasurement and intangibles. And this, this is always existing whenever there's intangibles. Where it becomes an issue, it's in sort of the long run, those two things balance out. So if you just have a little bit of this going all the time, it's no big deal. It kind of aggregates out to zero. But the, if there's a significant enough a technology or set of technologies, general purpose technologies that drives a large enough wave of intangible investment, that's where it can start showing up in the aggregate productivity statistics. And so yeah. we don't know we have, I, I wouldn't say we know this wave is here yet, but again, if you look at that potential and you think it's substantial, that would be one thing I'd wanna keep my eye on uh, going forward. Thank you. Very clear. And I, I think to, to some extent, this, of course, we've seen this a little bit before when we had previous waves of, of uh, the technological revolution, I think in the IT in, in the 90s when, uh, but what we've also seen then a little bit, there were quite a lot of countries that were investing probably similarly in some of these intangibles and also in, in, in digital technologies. 
but not everybody really saw sort of the pickup in productivity to some extent that we probably expected. So I think you saw much stronger impacts in, in, in the US on productivity from the first, from previous waves of digital technology than we've seen in several European countries. So is there something else? Is it, you know, is it not only the technology that basically needs to feed through and that basically needs to happen, but also some other things that, that, that need to be combined with it in terms of what, what needs to happen? I mean, just going back to Kiara a little bit, who spoke about reallocation, perhaps, is, it, is that one of the things that we see more of in the US than we see in some European countries? And just, just wanted to, to get your, your views on that a little bit. Yeah, great, great question. I think it's, there's no doubt, and we know this in so many different ways, you can't just take a technology, whatever it is, as a box, give it to a producer, and expect that that box gets them to the frontier. A whole bunch of things need to happen, both within the firms and in the market environment, the institutional, the legal, the competitive environment, to really get the full benefits of a technology. And I think that's where these metrics that Kiara was talking about, you know, things like reallocation and how well diffusion works inside industry, things like that. Those are really important to keep track of because those are measurable, measurable signals of the type of um, the type of processes that have to happen to really harness the technology. You can't just give a new whiz bang thing to, to producers and expect they're going to get it, get all the benefits from it. All this other stuff has to happen. And, and those are the things we need to, we need to look at in the data to see whether it is happening. And, and I should mention as important as technological and productivity diffusion is um, we just, know so little about the details of how it happens inside industries. And I'd like to, I wish we did, I could give a lot sharper prescriptions here, but I think that that's a real area in our gap. We can sort of measure, we can always measure frontier to median productivity differences, that sort of thing. So we can see the outcomes, but what actually moves those around and why, why it happens to accelerate sometimes and decelerate other times despite its importance is something we just don't have a great grasp of. Jackie just sent me, a, passed me a, a great question, which I think is, is relevant. I mean, you just described that problem of intangibles and it feeding through and the UK with a very large services sector, a lot of financial services, a lot of intangibles to some extent. Could this be a bigger problem to some extent in the UK than it could be perhaps in some other uh, European countries like Germany or so on, with, which have a slightly different sector. Um, and, and also going back a little bit to what PR was speaking about, where we do different, we see some, some European countries doing a little bit better in productivity performance. So is there an issue here for the UK to really be more uh, really aware of? Yes, I, I think, you know, that's something that I'm often crosses my mind when I think about UK productivity performance is sort of the outsized role of the financial sector I mean, talk about mismeasurement. That, it, what is the output of a financial firm, right? I mean, even that very basic question one has to answer to measure productivity is, is probably harder to answer in, in that sector than in any other. So beyond just the, you know, the, the intangibles issues I described, that exists even in a perfectly measurable, uh, measurable world except for the intangibles. But then when on top of that, you throw it in a sector where even what's supposed to be the tangible part of output is hard to define. Well, then it gets very difficult. So yeah, I think that that is something that that is um, constantly an issue when you're thinking about per measure performance there. And and you know both it's important. So anything that happens in the sector is going to have outsized influence on the aggregates. But also, are you measuring? what you want to measure and, and how does that change over time? Can, can I perhaps now take you a little bit to what all of that and Bart said that earlier on, we are a group that's trying to think about policy as well. What, what does your view on this uh, imply for policy thinking for the UK? You've spoken a little bit about already about the fact there are many things that need to happen, many things that are probably important, uh, particularly in this translation of technology and intangibles into productivity. Um, but also from your perspective on what you know about the U.S. performance and so on, what, what does it really mean in terms of priorities to think about? Sure. So I think it, 
below all else is the flexibility of output and input markets. We know so much productivity growth comes not just from individual companies doing what they do better, but also from the market reallocating activity from less efficient producers to more efficient producers, be that among existing producers or through a process of entry and exit of company. And so you want to have competitive output markets, which are competitive sort of summarizes how easy slash willing are consumers to switch among suppliers in response to price differences, which we would think reflect cost differences, i.e. productivity differences. And then also on the input side, I think, you know, output market competition gets a lot of attention, but input market flexibility and competition matters a lot too. It doesn't matter how flexible output markets are. If input markets can't move resources to the more efficient firms who would be able to sell more in output markets if they, if they could. So I think the flexibility and competitiveness of both factor and product markets are complements, And those are always things one wants, wants to be mindful of. You want it to be easy to start new companies, to hire new and better workers, for to find new workers, to invent new things. Any policy, any policies tied to that sort of dynamism are, are going to be important. I often get asked to talk about policies that might help diffusion of, of ideas within industries and how do you get best practices to spread around more quickly. And that's where I have to regrettably go back to my earlier point, which is I don't think we know quite enough about that process to have sharp policy prescriptions there. Uh, if I said with my productivity researcher hat on, well, maybe you should let companies get together and talk about the best ways to do things and become more productive that way. Then my industrial organization antitrust hat goes on and say, well, uh, wait, I'm not sure we want to have that meeting about how to operate <laughs> for other reasons. So I, I think that again, it's important, but I, I don't know, at least I don't feel comfortable giving really sharp prescriptions on that dimension. But in terms of the broader, like how do we make markets work well? I think that's something that is, is always first. Thank, thanks, Chad. I, I'm just looking first, whether there are any other of our witnesses who want to um, comment at this stage, or also if there are other commissioners who would like to come in. I know, Cecilia, you wanted to come in uh, a second ago, so if you want to come in now, you, um, your question may be to Chiara, but please, uh, please go ahead. Thanks, Doug. Maybe the other panelists can also help. Um, just say that I'm Cecilia Wong from Manchester University, and I'm not an economist. I'm a spatial planner, so forgive me if I interpret things wrong. but. My interest in very much from the spatial perspective, we all know that the UK, outside London, Southeast, basically the Northern region are really lacking behind. To a certain extent, our poor productivity can be attributed because these are lacking behind region, they don't pull their weight. But based on what John and Kiera say, uh, my understanding is that it is important is the quality factors of the production factor. They need to be high quality and the sectoral effect is not as important. Um, that back in a very interesting question that we know that in the Northern region, when we start mapping all the production factor, they're consistently very poor. And thus not surprisingly, after the restructuring of the manufacturing out, we get the service sector and they, they didn't perform well. So my question is, is there any intrinsic uh, place of space related factors that we think is still important to explain the poor productivity because particularly I find Beata is quite interesting. She mentioned charter work area earlier on about the market capture, the catchment area of trade. So that sort of thing, have those been analyzed and understand? And also John, you also mentioned about institution and that's very important and that tend to be pace based. And if we know that, then I have a, another provocative question is, so we advise the UK government since we know where the poor factor, uh, production factor is concentrated in where, why don't we put all the investment to sort out those factors in those poor performance regions? So that means we need to have very articulate and clear regional economic policies. I just interested in your view, you know, should we have that? 
So I guess this was more for John than for Chad, but John, you want to come in? Chad, anything you want to add? I think it might be for all of us. I mean, everywhere it struggle, it struggled with changes, you know, with uh, the decline in manufacturing, uh, you know, every country uh, and the, the decline of manufacturing that was regionally distributed and now is not uh, in advanced economies. Uh, and, you know, so that, that, that is a, I think it's a pretty common thing, right? I mean, the China shock, many people have looked at, which might help you know, some firms and businesses who are innovative uh, and parts of those businesses, but it's been very hard on uh, the blue collar workers, uh, you know, who are often distributed and then uh, they've lacked good jobs that have come in. Um, you know, I, I don't, I don't, again, you know, kind of, as I said before, I mean, place-based policies are challenging. Um, uh, you know, one set of policies is make it easier for people to move to high productivity regions, uh, but that doesn't help the place uh, so much. You know, another idea is trying to disperse, uh, you know, get more research, you know, disperse research funding so it doesn't just go to the top institutions, but to regions that, uh, you know, that can create new uh, university cores and innovative cores, uh, and that will then foster new businesses that will uh, get people. I mean, so in the US, I mean, the John Gruber and uh, Simon Johnson proposed that. Presumably the same thing would apply in the UK. I'll pass the wand on to Chad or Beato or well, Kiara. I, yeah, I, I would just say agglomeration mechanisms are really powerful. I mean, all of this, urbanization and sort of increase in the dispersion of productivity across space. Uh, I don't think any of that, it was so widespread. I don't think any of it happened for policy reasons. I think it was just the pure economic incentives that caused this concentration of, of activity because, because agglomeration mechanisms, and there are several, are so powerful. So the question is, what, what do you do in that kind of world? You can, for distrib distributive purposes, still, in some sense, over-invest in the low productivity areas. And there's a, I understand the case for that. But it's, in some sense, that's, that's just redistribution. I mean, maybe one thing to do, and this kind of gets at John's idea of like new cores, you can you can make little agglomerations in the areas that have been left behind, and so they sort of gather from the local area. They don't become the next. They don't become London too. They become, you know, the center of the of of the Northeast or something like like that. Because um, agglomeration mechanisms can work at different levels. So maybe that's one way to do it. I'm actually looking at space-based policy in Turkey, which has enormous. Uh, dispersion and average productivity across its regions. And the government there has tried very hard to uh, reallocate activity towards the lower uh, lower productivity regions with with some mixed mixed results. And we're trying to understand that. But I mean, the thing to re realize is you're fighting these agglomeration mechanisms that are not a result of policy. It's just pure economic incentives and they're and they're strong. So you always have to deal with that, I think unless technology just completely changes. Thanks, Chad. We're, we're trying to end up this session, but I do want to hear from Glasgow. Uh, so we'll, we'll um, talk to Anton and then the other, and then we'll finish. Thanks, Dirk. It really takes us back to policy. And uh, I mean, Chad, I just wondered, wondered if you might want to talk a bit about future uh, general purpose technology. I mean, the UK government in uh, last year published an innovation strategy in which it highlighted seven areas of technology where the UK is particularly strong in looking at ways in which to really ramp up translation. And I suppose, is there anything that, in terms of the lessons from the kind of adoption and diffusion of, of the kind of intangibles that you focused on, which you would advise uh, in terms of what the UK needs to do that? Should it direct so much focus on, on sort of these new areas of technology? Should it really focus its attention much more around application and diffusion? What, what would you say in terms of policy lesson from the work that you've done? I, this is a, a cop-out answer, but I mean, should try to do both, both pushing the envelope and catching up where where possible too. But I, I think the UK right now has good infrastructure to harness AI 
to harness biotech. I mean, there's, there's a reasonably strong pharma industry already in the UK, I think. And, and if you think about the university system and what it's good at, I think those two technologies, which a lot of folks are pointing to is being very important. The UK has got the infrastructure to grab it and start holding on as the frontier goes forward. So I would, I might think about a focus on those areas in particular. Um, but of course that, you know, that's speculative. But I, I think at least the UK is positioned if those things take off, both to, both to push the frontier in some elements and to stay at it if it if pushed uh, elsewhere. Thank, thank you very much, Chad. I, I mean, um, Beata, if you don't mind, I'll move to Alan Barrett, uh, and because you'll you'll be you're, you're next anyway, and then uh, you can pick up on anything you want to say uh, in uh, his um, in, in his uh, questioning. So, Alan, the floor is yours. Great, thanks, uh, Dirk, and uh, hi, everyone. I'm Alan Barrett. I'm the director of the Economic and Social Research Institute uh, here in Dublin, Ireland. And as Jagjit uh, likes to mention, uh, the institute has, has our institute has worked very closely with NYSER uh, for many, many years. They were set up in 1938, and they spawned us as a child, I think, in 1960. Uh, that's normally the way we de describe the link. Uh, so great! It's great to be here. Great to be part of this group, and uh, particular honour uh, to be getting to, to chat to Beata, uh, wh whose work is is both fascinating and, and incredibly relevant. Um, you you'll forgive me. A, a lot of my questions are going to be motivated from a, an Irish perspective, uh, but luckily, because of the last session, we sort of drifted into questions of regional considerations in the United Kingdom. Um, although it's said that there's a sort of a, an, an Irish impetus uh, to this, I think they're very, very relevant both to the sort of the devolved nations as in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, but also um, the various regions with, within England that, that might be lagging uh, behind somewhat. So I want to talk initially about foreign direct investment. And again, this picks up a little bit on what Cecilia uh, was talking about. I think Cecilia might have been talking about sort of generally about you know, uh, ideas of investing more heavily in areas that are lagging behind. Um, it, it might have been thought about there in terms of sort of public investment. Uh, but of course, foreign direct investment for a whole load of countries and a whole load of regions has been a sort of a very quick way uh, of having productivity in, in improvements. Uh, but I think one of the things I'd like to ask you, Beata, if I may, is while FDI can be very, very positive, uh, there's always a fear that you end up with islands of high productivity in terms of the firms that, that move into areas, but that if they don't connect in any shape or form, there's no spillovers to uh, the other firms in, in the locality or in the region, uh, you have the island of high productivity with actually very little real impact elsewhere. Um, and I'm wondering, is there evidence of sort of success in terms of FDI in certain areas having positive productivity spillover effects? Or to go back to some of the themes that Chad was talking about, is it the case that just as within firms, it can be very hard to get sort of dispersion uh, of good ideas and know-how, uh, is it equally difficult in terms of getting positive spillovers from firms uh, into other actors in the local economy? So if I can just hand over to you on, on that one to start with. Thank you very much, Alan. So um, there is a huge literature on spillovers from FDI, and I'm sure Chad would point out all the deficiencies um, with measuring productivity. Uh, but, you know, abstracting from the, those imperfections, the broad evidence that we have is that um, in developing countries, there is little evidence of spillovers within sectors. There is most, mostly competition effects. Entry of multinationals increases competition within sector, which pushes out um, the weakest firms. And that leads to improved aggregate productivity, but that's not knowledge transfer. In the context of the UK, there is a paper by Matt Slaughter and Fathers which showed actually evidence of positive spillovers operating within sectors. Um, and, you know, in general, the literature shows that the distance matters. Um, yeah, and do we know what the, do we know what, sorry for interrupting, but we do, do we know what the mechanism is to achieve those sort of spillovers? So, 
so there are two types of spillovers, right? One would be within sector spillovers. So here, this would be the standard arguments about, you know, workers from different firms mingling and passing uh, information to each other. That's, for instance, one mechanism. Now, there is also a lot of evidence on spillovers from multinationals to suppliers. And that's the channel which seems to be finding much more support um, across the studies and, and across wide range of countries, right? And here, um, so how does it work? A lot of times it works uh, through multinationals providing information to their suppliers on their expectations. So in the context of you know, emerging Europe, um, multinational may actually in conduct an audit of a potential supplier you know, from the place where inputs come to how output is packaged to how accounting is run and whether the IT systems are secure. And then they will introduce, um, they, will int they will stipulate requirements and say, if you are willing to do X, Y, and Z, um, then you can do business with us. So there is actually provision of information, right? Or um, actual knowledge transfer. Um, in other cases, um, the situation may be less clear. It's more about providing incentives. So for instance, we are going to do business with you if you obtain ISO quality certification, because that's what we expect of our suppliers. So I think you can think of this in terms of multinational offering a larger market, um, but requiring an investment. Yet another example, um, maybe for instance, retail sector, where large retailers are very efficient at um, distribution. So think about, I've, I've actually looked in my work at Walmart entering Mexico. Walmart has this uh, very sophisticated distribution system uh, where instead of deli making deliveries to an individual supermarket, um, you make deliveries to a distribution center. So for a small producer, delivering goods to one place results in much lower transport costs. And, but, you know, in return, Walmart would require periodic pro, uh, price cuts. So that means that um, the producers need, has a very powerful incentive to enhance productivity in order to be able to make a profit after those uh, price cuts. Okay. And typically, I mean, the sort of positive spillovers you're talking about, do, do they happen organically or are there some countries better at designing policies to foster these sort of interactions? There are countries that take an active policy to promoting these spillovers. Now, um, these active policies are perhaps more relevant to emerging markets where firms are less sophisticated. So, uh, for instance, you can have a supplier development program where you um, bring together multinationals and local firms and multinationals explain how they do business. And in an emerging market, they may make, they do business slightly differently. They have much higher requirements than local firms. Um, some of these programs go further and then choose best participants um, in order to provide one-on-one -on -one coaching or business advice or management consulting type of advice so that these firms um, can bring themselves to the level uh, at which they are able to actually get a contract and ful successfully fulfill a contract for multinational. Now note that these policies tend to be, such programs tend to be politically difficult because they are about helping better performers, right? Because the weakest SMEs stand no chance of doing business with a multinational. So there is no point investing in them for the purpose of uh, of doing business with an MNC. Okay, it's it, it's fast. I'm tempted. I'm, I'm going to ask a, a couple. Of, I just want to make sure we cover a number of, of areas, and we might we might have an opportunity to go back to some of the um, the FDI issues. But in your opening remarks, uh, you were talking about exporters, 
okay? And the, the productivity positive effects, if I can sort of put it like that, of market liberalization, trade liberalization, uh, whereby once trade restrictions are lifted, uh, exporters find themselves with, 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 with more potential markets uh, and that they tend to you know, meet this and that this is productivity enhancing. And I, I think we can all Im imagine that story. The only thing I'd sort of ask though is, is, is the following. It, 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 I mean, it's one of those sort of economic stories where, where we, 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 we see an opportunity opening and, and we assume firms are going to go after it. Uh, but of course, we know for most firms, uh, exporting, for example, can be quite a, a risky enterprise. You know, you're going into a new market that's um, uh, maybe somewhat unknown to you. Uh, hiring new staff or whatever, increasing the size of your business brings on challenges and everything like that. So there may always be a, 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 often a situation that even if the opportunity is there, uh, it doesn't actually mean that people are necessarily going to go after it. So I'm just wondering again, in terms of sort of your, your international experience here, um, are there are there policies that sort of assist companies as as markets uh, open, uh, or or again, if if it's just left to sort of yeah, um, uh, you know, pure market forces, are are there cases then when there's something of a missed opportunity? Um, it's a valid question. Now in in the case of a sophisticated country like the UK, um, I would hope that this would happen organically. However, there is scope for policy intervention where circumstances change and you need to inform firms about new procedures, um, new documentation, new requirements that come into play as a result. So, so in a sense, what you want to do is to uh, lower information asymmetries. You want to lower the fixed cost of doing business by providing information. Um, and that I think is quite applicable um, to the current situation where the access to external markets uh, is changing. And can, can I just, sorry, to, but uh, probably shouldn't mention Brexit, but it's always hard to get away from it. And uh, I, I think you mentioned it, so I'll, I'll blame you for, for bringing this down into the, this area. Um, but I mean, I obviously, you know, we had all thought about Brexit for a long time. And in terms of the impact on the, uh, the United Kingdom, there was the sense of the loss of markets uh, that, that, that Brexit would bring about. Uh, but if all these trade deals were going to happen, there'd be a sort of, a, you know, a substitution from um, from Europe, uh, you know, to, to, to these other markets. Um, but because, and quite correctly, you've introduced this sort of more dynamic sort of sense and the, and, the, and the possible productivity effects, that it was almost the way you sort of characterized it, that with, um, if there are sort of trade restrictions, more so on the services side uh, in the first instance, that you could have markets in, in a sense sort of res res restricting, and then there could be gap, a gap to these new markets opening. Um, it sounds to me like you're describing a sort of a Brexit effect that would be even worse than a lot of us had, had, had sort of thought about. And that in order to sort of rotate companies towards these new markets, exactly the sort of process that you've been uh, talking about there, it will take companies a length of time to start trading, you know, with with all these other companies. So our countries rather. So am, am I getting a sense that you're even more negative on Brexit uh, in terms of UK productivity uh, than even a lot of the discussion has been to date? Distance matters, right? Um, and, you know, if there is one relationship that's incredibly strong in international trade, distance explains intensity of a trading relationship. And interestingly, this is true both um, in goods and in services trade, right? And, and I think the fact that distance matters for services trade is uh, quite surprising to many, right? But if you think about this more deeply, it shouldn't be surprising because um, trading services often requires travel, right? And, and traveling shorter distances is less onerous. So, um, you know, it's not trivial to substitute or replace access to a very large market nearby with access to many small markets um, far away. The second point is that the knowledge, um, the information that information barriers 
are market specific. Um, and you know, the fact that you've exported to one country helps you with exporting to another, but it's, it's still entry into each subsequent market still carries a cost. So um, as new free trade agreements or um, integration agreements are going to come on, are going to come into reality, you will need to provide information about you know, that market, about specificity of regulation in that market. And regulation is much more important for services than in goods because it's simply there's more heterogeneity across countries. I mean, even if you think about the single market, uh, so the European Union, uh, there are regulations in the, that differ across countries in the same services industry, right? So um, it's not free to obtain information. Now, what if the cost of obtaining information is high, that means that only larger firms will actually attempt to enter that market. And that's actually indeed why we see that exporters are special. They are the most productive firms. They tend to be larger. They tend to employ more skilled workers. And importantly, um, they tend to pay higher wages. I'm going to touch on two more issues, uh, if I might. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll ask, they're kind of diverse questions. But again, if, if people want to uh, pick them up, that would be good. You touched on the issue of, of gender uh, differences. I think it's the specific example of, of, of maths attainment. And of course, that sort of set off in my head uh, the question that, you know, the standard uh, used to the old fashioned sort of notion amongst economists that there was a, you know, equality on the one hand and efficiency on the other hand. Uh, but I think our, our, our thinking has sort of changed on that a little bit over time. And can, can you, is there evidence of uh, sort of broader inequality, productivity, stroke efficiency linkages. And by that, I'm, I'm sort of suggesting where you have very unequal societies where substantial proportions uh, of the population are not getting educated relative to, to other groups. Okay, so it's broader than just gender. Uh, that you're, you're, you're missing two things. I mean, firstly, there's a, there's a, a, a lack, a, a smaller amount of human capital because not as big a group of people are being educated. But there's also a, a, a sense then that it might be, again, quite an old fashioned notion, but if the elites are going to get the jobs anyway, uh, that the competition sort of a jobs and, and innovation is not quite as strong as if you're educating a much broader group of people and ensuring then that there's competition for college places and subsequent employment. So I'm just sort of broadly thinking uh, in, in terms of that link between the board, the, the, let's say the equality agenda, which we may not typically think in terms of, uh, when we're having productivity discussions, uh, we're placing that into the productivity discussion. So is there is there something to, to think about there? You know, here I would think of the Irish story um, that uh, Ireland and foreign direct investment that I think is quite instructive here, right? I think initially Ireland marketed itself as uh, a manufacturing location for supplying uh, the continent, the European continent. Then Ireland started marketing itself as a location with highly skilled labor. So, um, and that was the factor that made it attractive to FDI inflows. Now Ireland is marking, marketing itself as a place where the big high-tech firms uh, need to be, right? So, so in a sense, it's, um, I think there is, um, there is role for policy in how you want to position yourself. Also, if you think about inflows of foreign direct investment, you know, I'm a great believer in investment promotion. Investment, but not investment promotion in terms of handing out subsidies or uh, tax holidays, but investment promotion as a way of lowering the entry barriers, the fixed cost of entering the country. And, you know, to sort of come back to Cecilia's uh, question about, you know, what can be done for backwards regions, um, I would say two things. One is infrastructure, because 
high quality infrastructure matters. Infra infrastructure services are an input into both manufacturing, because you need to transport goods, and into services, because these consultants need to fly around the world. Uh, so high infrastructure, can, high quality infrastructure can boost productivity. And then the second thing you can do is try to market a particular region as a location with cheaper labor force, high quality infrastructure, so a good location to do business. And as the world is changing, and you know, as we are moving more and more towards hybrid work, um, where you, you, we are decoupling where we live and where we work. Because if you have to show up in the office only twice a week or three times a week, you are able to call it, tolerate a longer commute. So again, this is a chance uh, for regions that are somewhat backward to attract new business and, um, and become and revive themselves. Great. Thanks for that, Peter. Uh, Chad, have you got a question? I was just going to pick up on, on your points about the ties between equality and access or whatever you want to, would want to call it and, and productivity. I think there are two mechanisms, one which you basically described, which I, I guess I would call a statistical discrimination model, which is if, if there's a group or groups who know they're not going to get a fair shake in the market for whatever reason, they have less incentive to invest in things that would make them more productive. And so that otherwise productive investment doesn't happen. And the real tragic thing about it is that lack of investment then confirms to the people blocking access to the market that there was a reason to do it. So that's that's one mechanism. The other mechanism is a misallocation of, of colleagues. Eric Kirst, for example, has worked on this, which is, you know, if if we basically exclude a group of, of folks from uh, the market or a part of the market, the ones who would have been good at it, we don't get the benefits of it. You know, just to give a particular example, go back 60 years, 5% of the physicians in the US were women. Do I really think we had the best, best set of physicians we could have when only 5% were women? No, I don't, think, I don't think that's the case. We were just losing out on talented people because for whatever reason, social mores had kept them out of that market and put them in other places where they were talented and good at it, but they would have been better physicians. So that's the other way that that productivity is affected by this, this sort of issue that you raise. Great. Thanks for that. So I'm getting messages from Jack Jude saying we're getting uh, tight on time. So I better hand back to our uh, our overall chair at this stage. But thanks, Beata, and thanks to Chad. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you, Beata. And thank you to each of the witnesses for a, a wonderful session. We'd originally allowed a bit of time for people to to come back with one very short uh, response, but I, I think we're we're past past four o'clock, so I, I think I'm inclined to um, just give a final thank you to some really excellent interventions and insights from uh, John Fanal, Chiara Crisciolo, Chad Syerson, and um, Beata Javorczyk. If any of you want to make sort of some two-hander type interventions, ju just, just send us a note or an email. We'll be very happy to have further discussions with you. I think we're all friends now, or well, we were before anyway. We haven't fallen out for the last two hours, which is important. And, um, and it could be as we write our scene setting report in the spring and summer, we may come back to you for some clarifications and questions that I'm sure you will be able to help us on if you possibly can. So, uh, and I also want to thank the commissioners really for, for involving themselves so constructively in this process and helping us put this together, as well as the number of people that you, you can't see who really, I'm really grateful for all the work they've done in Pulisian, Matt, Matt Pantelli, Issam, Samiri, and Konstantinos Marodis. Uh, as well as the team at NISA, uh, Neil Lakeland, uh, Rihanna and Luca and others really for helping us put this together. It's part of a process. We have another evidence session that will be not very long down the road. On the 16th of March, a couple of policymakers, Jesse Norman, uh, uh, an MP, and Kitty Osha, who was an MP, but is now policy director at the Institute of Directors, will be talking specifically on policy questions. That'll be on the 16th of March. Um, shortly, you'll be able to register uh, on the NISA website to to uh, listen to that or watch that as you may wish. But even today's event will shortly be on the NISA's 
YouTube channel. Uh, and I think we'll be watching it ourselves carefully to sort of pick up the nuggets that we need to do in order to push these questions forward and ask questions ultimately of our policymakers in this country as to what they might do. I've certainly picked up along with the things the quiz. I'm not going to summarise them all because that will take us even further past the hour. But I want to thank you all very much for joining, for participating so well. But um, I don't think we've solved it. We've just scratched again the surface a little bit more. Some gold, some steel, some rust. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll slowly begin to understand this. Thank you all very much. We'll see you all very soon. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye.